This is Fifth, and you're watching the XJW Fifth YouTube channel. My guest today is Jacob. Uh, he's a former Bethelite, meaning that he worked at the headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses located in New York. Uh, he's also a former regular pioneer, uh, which means that he devoted 70 hours per month in the evangelizing and proselytizing work uh, on behalf of the Jehovah's Witness organization. And he was also a ministerial servant, which essentially is a helper to the elders in the step right before uh, being appointed as an elder within the religion. Uh, Jacob, I'm very happy to have you on today. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out to speak with me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And uh, we kind of have an interesting uh, shared history uh, to, to a degree. Uh, we both were at Walk Hill. Uh, we uh, served at Bethel at the headquarters uh, of Jehovah's Witnesses. Remind me what years you were there again? So I went to Walk Hill at the very end of 2003. And then I left at the beginning of 2011. So in all, it's about seven years. Okay. And I was there from 07 to 09. So we definitely overlapped. And I remember seeing your face around, but I'm pretty sure we never even had a conversation. I don't know if you remember anything different. Probably not, but you look very familiar to um, Bethel is a big place and there are a lot of people there. Uh, if, if you don't work in the same area or interact in this congregation, there's a good chance you you miss somebody. Exactly. And um, when I was talking to you earlier, it sounds like uh, you did work. Some of the places that I worked, you worked in the same vicinity as well, but your job was just different. You were you were doing maintenance on the machines, whereas I was packing the literature. But it was I was packing the literature on the machines that you were doing maintenance on. Right. Correct. Yeah. But yeah even still, I worked. We just missed each other. Go ahead. Yeah, I worked on the printery maintenance crew. Uh, we we worked in the bindery, shipping, and press room. Right. Yeah, and I was made. I was mainly in shipping. So, um, but wow, so it sounds like you had a very uh, you had a lot of different assignments at Bethel, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. So let, let's start um, with just your background with the Jehovah's Witnesses religion. How is it that you became introduced uh, to the religion? Well, I was born into it. Uh, my parents were were Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I'm actually fourth generation. Mm. Uh, so both sets of my grandparents on mom and dad's side uh, were witnesses, but also my great grandmother on my mother's side was a witness as well. So technically I'm fourth generation. Wow. Was fourth. Generation. Did you feel any pressure growing up to be a Jehovah's witness or did it ever cross your mind that wow, you know, I'm expected to be this, but I don't necessarily want to or anything. Did that ever cross your mind? Well, I mean, it, there was no question. I mean, it's just what you're expected to do. And um, we'll talk about the different phases I went through of, of making the truth my own. But pretty much there was no no real questioning or early on. Sure. And how old were you when you got baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? I was baptized right at that ideal age when you want to make lifelong commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, at Thirteen years old. <laughs> when I was baptized. Okay. Uh, and do you remember what motivated you to get baptized? Um, there was a couple couple things um, around that time is when I decided to make the truth my own, as as they say. Sure. Uh, in the organization and it's where I made the decision like, am I going to believe this? Am I going to be participating in this just because it's something my parents want me to do? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that I've proven to myself and this I um, can have conviction within myself that this is where I want to do. It was around middle school, around that age, okay. uh, 13, uh, where I made that decision to, to do, do some research on my own, prove these things to myself and then feel comfortable actually going out and, and just telling other people about my Sure. So you mentioned a little bit earlier that, you, you know, your family was very active. Uh, you mentioned specific mem members of your family. What were some of the positions or responsibilities that, uh, that different individuals in your family had? Okay. Yeah. So my family was very active, very, um, spiritual, mm -hmm. um, in truth. And, uh, my older brother, he went to Bethel right out of high school. 
Uh, my older sister, she moved to a foreign country in Ecuador and stayed there for over 15 years. And my little sister, she did a lot of need greater work. So my whole family, yeah, we're very busy and active in the, in the religion. I see. And again, that probably set some goals for you kind of automatically, maybe some expectations because they were involved to the extent that they were. I would imagine. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, no, it was it was just pretty much expected that when I graduated high school, I was mm-hmm. going to pioneer and then go to bed. Right. How long did you regular pioneer? Uh, actually, I wanted to correct something you said at the beginning about 70 hours a month. When I first started pioneering, I actually... It was 90 hours a month mm. when I first started pioneering for the first few months, and then they changed it to 70 after about first six months or so. Oh, I forgot about um, that. So how long I pioneered? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, the plan was for me to graduate high school, pioneer for about a year or so, and then go to Bethel. Well, turned out it only was about six months, and then I got in trouble for doing something, made a stupid mistake. It was objectively foolish, uh, something a young 18-year-old got himself into. So I lost my privileges of service, as they are called, uh, which is regular pioneer and ministerial servant that I was. And um, so that was pretty devastating time for me in my life Mm. um, because it was embarrassing. It was unexpected. I I felt like I was a disappointment. Um, But I was determined Bethel was still my goal. And so even after that incident happened, I was determined to get back on track and uh, keep uh, keep doing good to, to where I could get back onto the road to going to Bethel. So, okay, so you lost those so-called uh, privileges of service. What did you do with that time? Because usually when you lose those, you, you know, you're not able to get them back right away, even with good behavior. So what did how did you take advantage of that time? Well, actually, my mom uh, helped me and encouraged me. To, uh, she's very um, my whole family is good at making use of their time and taking advantage of opportunities. And so at that time, it's like, well, you're going to have some time. A year, at least a couple of years before you go to Bethel. Mm-hmm. Why not use that time now to take some extra schooling, higher education? And since I did well in school, um, it was easy for me to get a, a scholarship, a combination of scholarship and, and federal grants to where I could, I basically went for two years where I only had to just pay for the cost of my books and material. Wow. And so... That's what we did. I uh, took advantage of that time. So in retrospect, that event that happened that was embarrassing and devastating, mm-hmm. it's uh, bittersweet because on one hand, it was the worst time in my life. And on the other hand, looking back, it was one of the best things uh, as far as like where I am now, the job that I have now, mm-hmm. that education, that degree. I got an associate's degree in electronics. Uh, it even helped at Bethel, the job I got at Bethel. So, yeah, it's an interesting event that happened there. Uh, now on one side, it was the worst, um, but on the other, it was one of the better things that happened. So. Sure. So eventually you did get to Bethel, as we as we talked about. You were there for a number of years. Um, how old were, were you or what were the circumstances surrounding you uh, eventually going to Bethel? Okay, well, it took a little time. Uh, first of all, I had to start pioneering again, sure. which I did. Uh, and went to completed pioneer school. But also, uh, there's something called temp work that you can do where you work at Bethel uh, for a temporary basis, whether it's two weeks or a month or three months. And that's how I got my foot in the door was I, I did temp work uh, several times, three, four times, uh, a couple of times in Brooklyn, a couple of times in Walkill before I actually got called to Bethel full time. But I actually enjoyed doing that temp work because every time I went, I got assigned to a different department. I worked on the electrical crew in Brooklyn, structural crew in Brooklyn, and architectural crew in Wallkill, and got to meet a different group of people and and, uh, get familiar with uh, different departments at Bethel. And so I actually enjoyed the time I did temp work. Right. So after doing that temp work, obviously, eventually, as you said, you did get called in to be a permanent uh, Bethelite. What kind of work were you assigned to do? 
so I got called into Wallfield Bethel permanent, and my first assignment was in the pipe insulation crew, um, which it's something not something I had done before, but I did have construction uh, background. I worked with my dad in construction and it, uh, a branch of the construction trade, and so it wasn't that hard for me to pick up and learn, and I, and I enjoyed learning something new. And at that time, when I went to Bethel, the end, right there at the end of 2003, beginning of 2004, Wallkill was right uh, in the middle of their printery expansion project, which was a huge project, building the, the new printery, uh, where all the, the five printing presses at one time used to be. That was a huge project, and so a very busy time, a lot of construction work going on. So it wasn't, I wasn't surprised that I got put into uh, construction field even though i did have that electronics degree i had no uh, no expectations or whatever of getting put into the electronics department right away especially at that time during that project but yeah i i was my first assignment was pipe insulation and i worked in that for probably about two years mm-hmm. uh, def- definitely until after the the project was concluded the primary project was um concluded uh, and then after that, I got called into the electronics uh, shop. I see. So how would you describe overall, um, kind of in the context of being at Bethel, uh, how would you describe your overall experience at Bethel? Did you enjoy it? Yes, I I enjoyed my service at Bethel. I enjoyed the work that I did. I enjoyed the, the friendships that I made. Um, and I just enjoyed the status of being a Bethelite, which was a a special privilege of service mm-hmm. uh, that carried a certain certain level of prestige with it that I that I enjoyed, and also it was just the lo- the goal that I had from since I was a young man. You know, when I was a kid, uh, our family went on uh, several different uh, bus visits to to tour Bethel. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would charter a bus. Did you ever go on one of those bus trips that they would organize to go to Bethel? I did. Yeah, on one one occasion, I think when I was. 18 or so before I went, before I went to go uh, work there. Sure. Yeah. So, so Bethel has been a a goal of mine for a long time. So yeah, it was nice to to realize that goal. I enjoyed my time there. Um, There were some interesting things that I I didn't enjoy as much maybe as I thought I would. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's a, uh, and that would, what I'm referring to there is the governing body member. So that's a, a big, um, asset that a lot of people think of being at Bethel is you're closer to the, the governing body if you hear them speak directly in their morning worship uh, com- comments and um, and watchtower study. Um, but honestly, my impression was I was kind of unimpressed or underwhelmed by their, their teaching ability and uh, the way they presented themselves. Uh, I wanted to tell you early that that my role models from early on were the circuit overseers and who were very good teachers uh, and very good speakers. They were just captivating. I would actually listen to recorded on cassette tape a talks of circuit overseers that I had in my congregation in Tennessee. Mm. I would listen to those tapes over and over again. Sometimes I would play them in my car on the way to the congregation meetings and let other people listen to them to those recordings, especially of the, the one circuit overseer that, that I really looked up to. Um, and then, so to contrast that speaking and teaching ability of the circuit overseers with the governing body members, I was just like, hmm, eh, it's, I wasn't that impressed. Mm-hmm. They, in fact, the, the impression I got more than anything like, so that was just oozing out of them was their arrogance and their pride in how special they were i didn't i didn't get the impression of somebody that was humble uh and super spiritual and you know that was going to rule with christ jesus in heaven Mm -hmm. i just didn't get that impression uh from from my interactions and from what i saw of the governing body Mm -hmm. What's interesting about uh, you, as we've talked about a little bit before coming on, is that your experience of 
waking up happened while you were at Bethel. Can you kind of describe how that process started? Maybe what some were, what were some of the uh, just factors that played into your, you know, coming to to a different conclusion? Sure. Well, it's kind of a long story with various aspects to it. Mm -hmm. I, I would categorize it as there's a lot of like smaller events or small straws on the camel's back, so to speak. And then there was one defining uh, moment where I had a a cognitive like break and made the, made a decision. But to start off with some of those smaller things that were like little red flags, you know, going off in the back of my mind or, or doubts, you might call it. Uh, Some of those smaller things, an example would be uh, the songbook. They came out with a new songbook, the first new songbook. I think they've had multiple new songbooks since I've left. So, but the, one of the, the first newer songbooks they came out with, I just did not like it. I did not care for the music in it, the way it sounded, or just the words in it. Uh, or it just it was. It seemed very uh, somber and depressing, and or just it wasn't uplifting. It wasn't upbeat, and it wasn't. They didn't have good rhythm to it. Just so, just musically, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Nothing else other than that, but but that was kind of a big deal because here's a, a provision from Jehovah's organization that I was supposed to like embrace with open arms and be thankful for, mm-hmm. and I just found myself being like, hmm, I just I don't like this. It wasn't an improvement in in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was just uh, a little one little red flag. Um, another one would be. Uh, an article I found while doing research in a bound volume in a library e-building. And this article was on the dangers of CB radio, you know, like truckers used to talk talk (laughs) to each other. Yes. So this was back in the 1970s, I believe it was a wake article on the, the dangers of CB radio and the, the rhetoric and the language they used in that article to, so like demonize CB radio and its dangers and how we have to be on guard against it. It just reminded me so much of like an, an article that they would write about the internet, you know, the dangers of the internet and the pitfalls. And I just found that so like humorous, really, to, when you, especially when you read that article now about the dangers of CB radio. Um, but again, that was another one of those little red flags. I was like, oh, here you're, you're criticizing uh, this is spiritual food from Jehovah's organization that that I'm, you know, joking around with. And so, again, that might have been another little straw on the camel's back, so to speak. Sure. And then just one other that I could mention that's kind of significant was a book that I read mm. uh, called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. I actually have it right here. It's a book right here. Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Great book. Anybody... Uh, wants to lower stress in their life, uh, I rec- strongly recommend it. Well, there's a, a sister, a lady, a uh, secretary in the department, electronics department, that had that book sitting on her bookshelf in her cubicle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's slow times during work. If you go in there to talk, um, I saw that book sitting on her bookshelf, and I'd pull it out and just flip it open and look at a chapter here or there. They're, they're individual small chapters uh, that appeal to me. And I was like really impressed with the things this this book had to say about how to how to get along and interactions with other people, even difficult people. It's a great book for um, how how not to take things personally, how to like, get rid of negative thinking. Very practical, very useful information. Mm-hmm. It turns out I borrowed the book. I read the whole book cover to cover, and it's just like wow. My impression was. If everybody in the world like read this book and applied the information principles in this book, it would solve the problems of the human race, you know, because everybody would be super chill and there wouldn't be all the conflict we'd see. But then that, again, was like a little, little red flag, like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to think that thought about the Bible is the, the book that's supposed to bring salvation to the world. But I just couldn't stop thinking here. Here is this little like pocket size book that I think has so much more valuable, practical information to help people out in their lives. That there's there's not interpretation to it. That, that nobody's starting wars over this book. 
it's just simple, you know, to the point, but so helpful. And, and so that was another thing that just like that, you know, all of those little straws that stuck in, in, in my head um, that made me, made me question about the, the importance of the truth or the, how useful it was. Right. Okay. So those were some of the, the small things. Uh, the larger event took place um, at the Kingdom, Kingdom Ministry School. So that's a school for ministerial servants and elders. Uh, I think it's a uh, every two year school that comes around for elders and ministerial servants. And it was at that school where, so just to, to backtrack a little bit or give a little background, at that time I was very active. Uh, in my congregation, like the, I mentioned to you, things with the accounts, the talk coordinating territories, but even I was also working on public speaking, working on giving a public talk, a lot of responsibilities, and then not to mention at Bethel. Um, so I felt like I was doing everything I was supposed to do, everything I could do. I was even a foreign language, you know, kingdom all. Um, but yeah, when I went to that KM school, it, it was just a lot of uh, them telling, you know what, you could be doing more. You could be doing more. Here's here's what you, you could do better, and here's what you could do more. And that just really got to me. It just because at that time, I was giving Bethel, I was giving the organization everything I had of my life. You know, I was devoting my life. And yet it just didn't seem like enough for them. And, and I came out at the end of, uh, end of the day from that school. And that was my breaking. That's actually the moment where I just, I didn't say, uh, I didn't think, oh, this, this is all wrong. I'm leaving tomorrow. That wasn't my thought. It's just more that I finally conclusively said something is not right. Hmm. I don't know what it is. But something is not right within this organization. Um, and so I made up my mind to start doing some honest research on the Internet. And there is a public library. The College li New Pulse Library um, was nearby. So I made up my mind to go there and start doing some honest research about Jehovah's Witnesses. Just type in Jehovah's Witnesses into Google, YouTube. And finding out what I'm missing because the, the, the pieces weren't just weren't adding up in my mind. I wasn't happy. Um, I felt like here I am. I'm doing everything I should be doing. I should be happy. You know, I should be satisfied. I should feel good. But I didn't have any of those feelings. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I, I felt the, the pressure. Uh, there was a burden, a heavy load. And that I wasn't doing enough. And so that's that's what finally broke. Um, yeah, so those are the main events that led up to it. Okay, so um, after you you know allowed yourself to, to do that research, what were your conclusions or what were your next moves, let's say? Okay, well, uh, let me tell you about some of the resources online that I looked at. So okay, sure. Uh, as, as you know, there are... There's some things out there that are a lot of uh, anger, bitterness, and resentment, and people ranting about how uh, Jehovah's Witnesses ruined their lives in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to discredit those people and their emotions because those emotions are definitely warranted. And uh, I understand that. But at that time, I was looking for more logical reasons um, for why this why this organization didn't have the truth. And ever, I want to, again, backtrack and go back to the, the very beginning when I made the truth my own. What made the truth the own to me was proving the Bible doctrine, whether it's the Trinity, hellfire, immortality of the soul. It was very important to me that we had the truth that separated us from the other religion. And then when I started investigating that online and the resource that I would direct everyone to, I'm sure everybody already knows, but if you don't, JW Facts is the website 
that has just clear, no emotion, just logical, researched facts uh, about these different doctrines within Jehovah's Witnesses. And so when I found that, that it just made it all fall apart like a house of cards. Mm. Um, especially I remember the, the flood. Noah's flood was a big deal to me. Um, there's so many holes in that. And that's why I was like, once you find out the truth about Noah's flood and you realize, wow, why, how did I ever even believe this to, to start with? Um, is a little bit uh, very eye-opening. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that is what really uh, convinced me uh, that, okay, this is not the truth. Uh, so that, and then uh, I'll also give another shout out to um, a YouTube channel, Ex Gilead Missionary, had a YouTube channel, which uh, he had some very good videos. Again, a calmly explained logistical fallacies in uh, the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, and I really enjoyed those videos. And it turns out I actually met um, the author of that channel. Mm. And he helped me later on outside. Uh, once I left Bethel, he was very helpful to get me on my feet. But uh, those two resources were very helpful to me at that time. I, I actually had an, an opportunity to watch all of his videos as well. And those are from, I think, 2009 or something like that, maybe even before that. Maybe before that, yeah. Yeah, maybe 2007 or something. But, uh, but yeah, I actually found those videos very helpful myself when I was starting to do the research. I know that it's it's interesting. Um, I don't feel like his videos are talked about very much uh, within the XJW community. I don't even know if they've been mentioned on my channel, but I would I would agree with you in uh, recommending uh, those videos. They're, they're just presented in a very factual and calm way. Um, you know, this is someone who went to went to Gilead School and was taught by the best instructors in the organization exactly. and, you know, just kind of came to this honest conclusion, uh, you know, about, about everything. So I, I would recommend those as well. Yeah. Yes. That, that was another important factor when I was doing my research mm -hmm. was that it, or listening to other people's experience, that it was somebody that I could relate to, not somebody that just was not that active in their local congregation, mm -hmm. but, um, his channel, he like you said, he was high level, high status in the organization. Yes, similar to what I had, so I could identify with him. I felt we were on the same level, and I took the things he had to say with a lot more respect. If if that makes makes sense, absolutely. But so that was that was very important. Sure. Yeah, my experience was very similar uh, upon watching those videos. Okay, so now maybe it would be a good time to uh, to ask you. What did you do after you finished doing all of that research? What was your, your next step? Yeah, so that's when I had to make the decision, like, well, what do I do now? Um, I can't just immediately walk away because I would have no friends, mm -hmm. no, no way to make it in the outside world. So I had to formulate a game plan, how, how, to, how to back away and distance myself from this organization that was such a huge part of my life. Well, step one was to leave Bethel. And um, so I made, I told my parents, I called them, I told my congregation, ever, the overseers at Bethel, let them all know, but I didn't tell them why, of course. Um, and everybody was understanding. And uh, my parents were glad to have me home. I worked on construction projects. And uh, so there was no really red flags raised by me telling people that, that I wanted to leave because people come in and out of Bethel, as you know, uh, for, for certain periods of time. So it wasn't anything extraordinary, the fact that I wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. So put in my notice to leave. Uh, I moved back to Tennessee, where I'm from. Um, and that's where it got difficult because, uh, you know, I moved, stayed with my parents for the first couple months. Well, worked with my dad to save up some money. But uh, I was still expected to attend the meetings. My parents expected to see me there in field service. And um, so at first I was like, well, sure, I'll, I've done this my whole life. How hard can it be to just sit, to sit through a few more meetings? Well, after those first couple of months, it just got harder and harder to sit through a meeting when you know and understand the truth. 
And it just, it almost got unbearable. So I have to keep up also as like a, a double life that I had to live because um, when I did have some free time, I could hang out with uh, another friend I had back home. But I had to like, when if we were out at a restaurant or out of the movie, I had to kind of be looking over my shoulder to see if anybody saw us together because then my cover would have been blown or whatever. And at a certain point, I'm like, this this just doesn't make any sense to me. You live this this double life and have to be so cautious. So and, at a certain and, point, and I'm sorry, your cover would have been blown because he was disfellowshipped as well. Exactly. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I realized the best thing for me to do would just to be to move geographically a location to a, a new place where I could start my own life, and it turned out to be North Carolina is where I ultimately I put my resume online and i basically accepted the first job that accepted called me in for an interview mm -hmm. and i accepted that that job and it turned out going back to ex gilead missionary he lived in the town mm. right where i got the job and so it worked out really nice he gave me a place to stay and uh and get settled um when I first moved, which would have been very difficult because not if you move to a place and you don't know anybody there, it's not the easiest thing to do, but he helped me out a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happened next? Uh, did you, you moved away from where your parents were? So were they asking about you or, or how did that go? So, yeah, it got harder and harder as time went on to uh, keep up this uh, facade, if you will, or, or this double life mm -hmm. of pretending like I'm still in this organization, but cognitively, mentally being out of it. And, you know, my parents are no fools. They're, they're smart. They can tell something had changed with their own son over time. The, the way of lack of participation in the meetings, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Um, so they were starting to put some pieces of the puzzle together that some something was different was going on. Um, but I held off letting them know um, my thoughts and the decision I had made until after I had left Tennessee and moved to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it was after a period of months of being in, in North Carolina where, again, my mom was asking, well, did you find a, a local congregation to, to sign up with? And I kept finding excuses to avoid those questions. Then I, at a certain point, I just realized, well, okay, now's the time I need to just come clean and let everybody know the decision I made. So mm -hmm. I wrote uh, an email, like a series of emails, trying to explain the reasons why the decision I made to leave the Jehovah's Witness. And that was, that was the official end of it. And... What was the reaction uh, to that, or was there a reaction? Oh, definitely was a reaction. Um, of course, they were very sad. They uh, they felt like I had been misled by Satan, and that the the apostates had had gotten to me. And um, and they they sent a, another email or two in reply, but after that, they they cut off all communication. Mm -hmm. Um, so what did an event that did happen shortly thereafter was I had one of my grandparents passed away and I had went back to Tennessee for the funeral and it was there where there was a, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was kind of like an informal elders meeting, mm. uh, form between my uncle, uh, cousin and my brother um met with me in my parents home and this is this had been after i had sent my email out so they all knew but i wanted the the chance to try to explain again uh, again explain the reason for the choice that i had made it was very important to me that they know that i didn't this isn't a choice i made because i wanted to get involved in morality fornications, do drugs. That, that was not my motivation for leaving. It was very important that they know mm -hmm. that this was a decision I made for sound logical reasons. And so I did my best to try to explain those. 
But at one point in that meeting, uh, they asked me, well, do you still want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Just point blank. And to be honest, I wasn't really expecting that, you know, up front of a question, that direct of a question. So I paused for a minute. Well, I, I can't lie. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the habit of, of lying. And uh, so I just I gave it, I told them, no, I, I guess I don't. Um, not unless I think I said something like not unless their policies change or their teachings change. No, I don't want to be a part of it. And then as soon as those words, as soon as the no came out of my mouth, they, they all, you know, drew a deep breath, kind of sat back and be like, well, I guess we don't have anything else to say. There's the door. You're free to go. And and that was the end uh, of the last I had communication. And, and, and this meeting, this kind of impromptu elders meeting took place where? In my parents' home. Okay. I see. All right. So what, ha what happened next? You, you, they told you there's a door and then what? Yeah. So that was actually <laughs> the day before the actual uh, funeral ceremony at the kingdom hall. Mm -hmm. So I attended the funeral and uh, I have mixed feelings about that. They, they did a good job of, uh, talking about the, my grandfather's life and uh, some of the major events of his life, which I enjoyed. They did that very well. But uh, as I think John Cedars has mentioned, uh, they also used it at, at, towards the end as a way to just advertise to everyone there to sign up for Jehovah's Witnesses to accept a Bible study to learn more about how you can you know, uh, be a be a part of the paradise. Right. So, uh, which I didn't appreciate that, that part of the, the funeral talk. But, um, after the funeral, I went back to North Carolina and things were quiet for, for a little while. I didn't hear, uh, no news, uh, from anybody. And at this point, I'm still, I'm not just fellowship. Okay. I'm kind of, I, I figured that I had just kind of did, done a successful fade away. Um, I hadn't joined a congregation in North Carolina. So I'm kind of thinking I'm in the clear, so to speak. Well, one day I get a phone call out of the blue from an elder in the Tennessee congregation that I moved back to. And he's like, he says, I just want to let you know we're going to announce that you're disfellowship. You're no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses at, at, at the meeting tonight. and want to like, let you know that. And I was like, wait, what? What? How? Why? How did this happen? Because uh, my understanding was that there had to be some kind of judicial committee form, you know, for a disfellowshipping to, to take place. And that hadn't happened. Mm. And so I'm like, well, how, how are they in a position like within Jehovah's Witness legal framework to do this. Well, it turns out that my brother, my cousin, and my uncle got together. They wrote a letter saying that they heard me. They witnessed hearing me say that I did not want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Wow. They wrote the letter, and then all three of them signed that letter. And that, and the, all three of them were elders in the, in the church. Uh, that's good. That was good enough. Uh, the fact that all three of them heard me say that I no longer want to be one of those witnesses. Apparently, that was good enough, and for them to make the announcement at the kingdom hall that I was his fellowship, and mm -hmm. so that's that's how I was informed that I was no longer one of those. Wow! So they they kind of they backed you into a corner and out of the blue asked you the question that was going to determine whether you would have, you know, a relationship with your, your family and friends and you weren't even aware of it because that's not, you know, that that's not, I don't think that's normal. I'm, I'm not even sure I've ever heard of, of, of it just going, you know, that, that quickly. And then they, they tell you later, Hey, this is what we're going to do. And then you find out everything else that went that, that must've been really devastating for you. I was shocked. I was yeah. surprised by, it. um, because I didn't think it was possible. I, I didn't know that, that that's how they, they could do that. But, uh, and what put a little more sting onto it 
the fact that it was my family member. So these yeah. three people that basically took the initiative to write this letter were my own family member. So their motivation was to get me expelled from the, the congregation. That, it hurt a little bit, to put it honestly. Yeah. Because um, I've known a lot of, growing up, you've known various people that get disfellowship. Sure. And I've frequently I've seen where a dis, disfellowshipped relative, uh, a witness will, will find a small excuse to, to have some small association with their unbelieving uh, relative. If they need to come over and repair their air condition or, or they need to pick up some money or they need this or that. They'll find an excuse mm-hmm. to interact with their family member. But I just, I thought it was pretty cold how my family did the opposite. They went out of their way to distance themselves from me. I was, I was, yeah, I was pretty hurt, hurt by that, but yeah. it, I wasn't super, um, like shocked though. I mean, cause I kind of, I knew it was coming at some point. It was a possibility, mm-hmm. but that's the other thing. Nobody ever called me. Nobody ever made an effort to, to try to heal me spiritually, mm-hmm. to rehabilitate me like, Hey, let's sit down. Let's have a discussion. Explain to us why these doubts you have. Nobody ever made any attempt to to try to bring me back, right. and that's what I, I just never understood. Even my own family members never made that attempt. And I often wonder, you know, if roles were reversed, if I was still in the organization, and let's just say one of them left, would I be that complacent and just be like, oh, well, they made their decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's they'll have to live with their consequences or whatever, or would I, would I pursue them and seek them out and be like, what's going on here? Are you crazy? Uh, you know, you're going to be destroyed in army grid. What's going on here? You know, explain this to me, make me understand why, why you're doing this. You know, I would, I would not just let it rest so easily. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that just, uh, it puzzled me. The reaction I got to my family, uh, they, they put up that wall very quickly uh, to block all communication. Yeah, that, that's that's something that I think is perplexing to, to a lot of people. I've had those same thoughts. Um, just to kind of comment briefly on that, sometimes, and I'm curious as to what your thought is, but I feel like sometimes, especially if you've been at Bethel or if you've reached these these kind of high levels, within the organization and then you say you don't believe it anymore i think especially people who haven't been exposed to that who maybe don't know they don't have the knowledge even organizationally that you have they're kind of like well what am i going to say to this guy and it's almost Mm -hmm. even maybe a little bit scarier you know like this guy is like not just an apostate he's like a super apostate because he reached the (laughs) the highs of the highs and now he doesn't believe it right i i don't know if you you feel i mean it doesn't justify it but i i sometimes i wonder if that's kind of some of the thought process no, you're you're exactly right. And the word uh, word that comes to my mind is intimidation, or mm-hmm. tim- they they feel a little bit intimidated. Sure. And I think yeah, that definitely had uh, something to do with um, with their hesitance to approach me or to engage in a dialogue or a uh, discussion. Um, they kind of knew they weren't going to bring anything to the table that I hadn't heard before, maybe. Right. But even if, even in that case, I still don't understand the lack of motivation to even try. Sure. You know, that still uh, still puzzles me. I'm completely in agreement with you there. Okay, so as you said, you know, they haven't made uh, any effort to try to you know convince you of the quote unquote error of your ways, if you will. Uh, how much effort do you put in, if any, to trying to convince them that? you know, what they're doing is, is incorrect or their beliefs are incorrect. Yeah. That's something I've struggled with, uh, over the years, the, what, what level I should take that to how I, how much effort I should put into trying to convince them. Mm-hmm. Cause on one hand, I feel like if they are comfortable and happy and satisfied in their world with their worldview that I should let, just let them be. But on the other hand, I know that 
if I was in those shoes, I would want somebody to wake me up. And so I think about that. And then I also think about what, how much good it would do. The, if I, the harder I would try to push and try to convince them, mm. it's just going to push them away more. So with all, taking into consideration all those things, I've decided to, to not, uh, I'm not sending them an email every day, every week trying to convince them um, I've said, I've said what I've needed to say and I feel like I need to just let it be. And as, as time unfolds, hopefully my hope is that events will transpire and become more and more obvious to them sure. until they'll finally, it will be, it'll be easy for them to see. They'll come to the same conclusion that, Hey, something right. Sure. Awesome. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a hope that I share as well with, with my family and many others do, uh, as well. Um, let me ask you this as we're talking about kind of trying to persuade people and, you know, whether or not to convince people, did you ever, uh, bring anybody like in your life as a Jehovah's witness, did you ever study with anyone and kind of bring them, uh, into the Jehovah's witness religion? And if so, you know, how do you feel about having done that? A good question. Uh, the answer is no. Thankfully, okay. I never did uh, bring someone in. But that brings up uh, something I did do that I feel good about is I had a friend in Tennessee I, I referred to earlier mm -hmm. that I would associate with in my free time while I was in Tennessee. We were actually best friends before I went to Bethel. And then we reunited uh, when I got back, although he is now disfellowship. But here's the thing is, is when I reconnected with him, even though he was disfellowship, he still had a lot of guilty feelings or feelings just like, well, they have the truth. It's the, it's the true religion, but I'm just not good enough. Like I don't measure up to their high standards. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm just too imperfect, too sinful. I, I can't do it. Well, you know, when I finally understood that was where he was coming from, I took it. I was like, no, 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 you, that is no need for those guilty feelings. And so what I feel good about is being able to open his eyes mm. in that sense to explain to him why, no, there's nothing to feel guilty about. <clears throat> and in fact, they do not have the truth, which, by the way, in the course of our conversation, I realize I've used the word truth when referring to their teachings. Uh, but that's uh Hopefully with the understood, I'm just using that as an easy way to refer to it, which I probably shouldn't do, but not that I actually believe it's the truth, just for clarification. Sure. But no, I proceeded to to explain to him uh, all the doctrinal fallacies within their religion and that, why he had nothing to feel guilty about. And so the scale, I helped the scales fall from his eyes mm -hmm. and uh, and he even... Uh, helped in turn because he's a very deep thinker, thoughtful person. And once I got him set kind of on the right direction, right thought process, he would even think of things that I had thought of before. Mm. Be like, oh, well, wait, did you ever think it? this doesn't make sense? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I never thought about that, but you're you're totally right. So it it was mutually beneficial. But I am I do feel uh, a little bit of measured satisfaction that I was able to help him get rid of a lot of those guilty feelings we had. That's great. That's great that you were able to do that. Okay, so obviously you're you're happy that you were able to uh, to convince your friend or, you know, share with your friend points to, to make him realize he no longer had to, de had to have those feelings of guilt. Uh, what else are you grateful for? Obviously, the situation is not ideal, and that's putting it, you know, very lightly. Uh, obviously, you have, you know, the estrangement from family members and from friends and uh, just kind of your whole belief system that you had your whole life has just been dismantled. Um, but what are you grateful for uh, after having come to this conclusion and, and left the organization? That's a good question. Uh, a lot of people that people have told my story to briefly, they're like, well, are, are you glad that you can celebrate birthdays now or you can celebrate Christmas or, or this or that? Mm -hmm. And I'm, um, I shrug and I'm like, man, well, I'm not in the habit of celebrating these things. So yes. it's uh, it's not that important of an issue to me. And uh, 
I'm not against celebrating them now, but I'm also not especially interested in it either. But to answer your question, what I'm most grateful for to be out of of that religion is my worldview. Pure and simply, their worldview, even though they would argue differently, is very dark and depressing. They they feel like they're living in Satan's world, surrounded by evil, wicked, demonic forces. They're they're just sitting around waiting for every day that is God going to bring Armageddon. Mm. And they have this weight on their shoulders that they are their job or their assignment to go out and try to save as many as they can, help bring them to the truth, whatever Mm. uh, phrase you want to use. To me, that's just such a dark, depressing worldview. And now that I'm out of that, I see I'm a much more positive person, positive worldview um, that, yes, this world is not a perfect place. There's definitely no shortage of problems, disease and government problems of governments and corrupt politicians and list is endless. But there's a lot of things to be thankful for, to see the beauty in in the world. I would strongly recommend watching some videos of Steven Pinker. If you don't know who that is, uh, look him up on YouTube. Uh, but there's so many positive reasons uh, for looking at the world with a much more hopeful outlook. And that's the outlook I have now that I'm most thankful for to no longer be a part of of that dark, depressing, negative, I would call it, mm-hmm. uh, worldview that Jehovah's Witnesses have. That's what I'm most thankful for. Right. I think that's very true. Um, It's great to have that much more positive uh, outlook. And I would argue that it's even healthier uh, to see the world, you know, through through that lens. Um, The other question that I wanted to ask you, Jacob, is we know that there are Jehovah's Witnesses that watch uh, videos from former uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, There are a lot of individuals that are just having doubts that are kind of doing some of the exploration that we did when we were kind of coming to this conclusion. For those people who are Jehovah's Witnesses who are starting to have doubts and are starting to take in some of this information, what would be your message to them? Hmm. There's actually quite a bit, I would say, to them. I've I've thought about this a lot. And uh, the first thing I've thought that I would say to somebody, uh, a witness that's having doubts, is I would, here's what I would do. I would ask them to give me the definition of the word propaganda. If you're watching this as a witness, describe to me, take your time in as many sentences, use as many illustrations, examples you want, Tell me, uh, like I'm a, a foreigner uh, having difficulty with the language, what does the word propaganda mean? Explain. And then I would say when you watch the videos that JW Org is putting out at the conventions and on their, their website, how does that differ from the definition of propaganda? I think that's a good, good point place to start. And the other thing, the other thing I would um, urge them to do is just keep up uh, with doing some honest research and don't be frightened. Uh, don't be scared of the truth. The truth should have nothing to nothing to hide. If it's the truth, then it should stand on its own, and there should be nothing to uh, they should have to fear. Right. Excellent points. Um, what about those who are at the stage where they have come to the conclusion that this religion and the, these, this system of beliefs is not the truth, um, but, and you know, they're still watching these videos, just continuing to take in more information, uh, but are confused as to what to do next or, or where to go from here? What, what would you say to those people? Right, right. So I've been in that position before, too. And to me, a big roadblock was, you know, the the line of reasoning um, from the Bible where Jesus' disciples said, well, who should we go away to? Only you have the sayings of everlasting life. Well, that that whole concept of who shall we go away to, that was actually a big roadblock to me personally. Because, yeah, sure, I blasted holes in all the doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses, but 
when it came right, right down to it, I still had that emotional bond to this organization. I still remember all those good times, the, the primary dedication, uh, the brotherhood, that warm brotherhood. That was still a big roadblock to my my decision making on what to do. Should what what steps should I make here? But thankfully, by doing like more research, it's it's really not hard to realize that Jehovah's Witnesses don't have the corner on the market, so to speak, of their brotherhood. And they just had a series of conventions all about love never fails that you can watch videos about. But that love is very superficial, very, very superficial. And so I would encourage you to, to do some more research. One, to just find out there are other organizations out there that that share a brotherly bond. Just, uh, for example, would be Islam. Muslims have a very close uh, I learned that from my friend back in high school. They have a very close brotherhood. They can travel around the world. You know, witnesses always say, oh, we can go to the other side of the world. We meet one of our brothers. We'll be welcomed with open arms. They'll give you the shirt off your back. What well, that same exact brotherhood exists within Islam, within Muslim culture. Uh, and to take it to an extreme, uh, again, the, the whole idea of, well, who should we go away to? Just put yourself in the shoes of somebody in an ISIS training camp, okay? From their point of view, they're in their own little paradise. This is theocracy as they see is the truth, the, the right way things should be, and their mission is to spread that to the world. And they might look at, well, this has got to be the truth, right? Because where else would we find this brotherhood that we have right here in the ISIS training camp, you know? And you just got to realize that that line of reasoning is faulty reasoning. Just because you have this, this fellowship, this brotherhood, and you, you might have these other positive qualities, you're really, you're getting the cart before the horse there. Mm -hmm. And you need to stop and think, well, just that in itself does not mean that we have truth. Um, so I would, I would just encourage someone to think about things like that. And uh, look for the, the, the superficialness uh, and the paper thin uh, aspect to, to how thin Jehovah's Witnesses love is. Uh, if you stop going to the meetings uh, or field service, it evaporates like that. And I would contrast that with friendships that I've made now outside of uh, with with people at work mm -hmm. Uh that I could fall on hard times. I could have car trouble. It could any number of things. And these people would give me the shirt off of their back. They would help me out. They would give me a ride to the airport. They would help me out. Why is it because we, we have the same belief system in you know, the same religion, same being, same belief in a, a superficial being in the sky. No, they will help me out just because they want to, because they're good friends. So to me, that is a deeper love, a deeper friendship than that shallow, superficial love in the organization. So, but that me, all, everything I just said, it took me a while for me to figure that out. That's a lot easier said than done, so to speak. Um, so I would encourage anybody that's having doubts and they're running into that roadblock of, man, you know, I just got back from this international convention where we were all dancing and singing Kingdom Song. And it was just, it's just like paradise. I look. I understand. I know what that feels like. It it, it feels good. Um, it's like a, a almost like a euphoria that you feel. You feel like you're part of an organization that has a a purpose. It's a good feeling. But that you have to just stop and think. Just because you have that feeling, that emotional feeling, does not mean it's the truth. And I would go. And that's what I was trying to get to by. When I talked about the word propaganda and these big videos that I'm seeing now coming from the governing body, from the organization, it's all emotional based. It's all drama. And they say, well, now let's take a look at this dramatization. And that's that's what they've devolved to. Also wanted to make a comment of how the organization has changed in that area. So you and me, you remember, you know, taking our Bible to school, having discussions with schoolmates, 
and we use the reasoning book. Remember, reasoning from the scriptures, people would even have the reasoning book bound in the back of their Bible to have it ready to use. So if anybody had a question about immortality of the soul, hellfire, or why does God permit suffering, hey, you could flip it open, you could find a list of scriptures, you could get into a conversation. I'm not seeing that much anymore. I don't know about you, but to me, uh, you know, even, oh, another thing is in the, the theocratic ministry school, which is kind of basically dissolved, where we got to practice our teaching techniques on the stage, and we would, a lot of our talks came straight out of that reasoning book, if you remember. Yes. Um, that's all kind of gone away, and it's really, uh, it's interesting to me how they've kind of realized they've given up the fight on trying to convince somebody through ideas and through an explanation, through reasoning from the scriptures. They don't reason. There's no more reasoning from the scriptures is the impression I'm getting that from the way the organization said it now. Now it's all here. Let's watch a video which will stir your emotions. This propaganda. This is all we have to offer to you. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, getting into a, a nuanced conversation about the detailed scriptures with reasoning, the reasoning book, etc. No, we'll just stand here with a cart and hope that you might come by and see a pretty picture of paradise and want to talk to us. That's what I find just perplexing to me, how, how the organization has changed. But I can't help but feel that the reason they have adopted that, that new strategy is because they realize they don't have a, a strong foundation uh, with with the internet and information is out there so readily easily available to people that are looking for information mm -hmm. and then it's going to be harder to try to convince people through that means and so they've they've um, they've gone to these emotional methods and mm -hmm. dramatizations to, to convince people absolutely those are all great points for uh, you know, people in that situation uh, to keep in mind. Um, and, and lastly, Jacob, I wanted to ask you about um, it, what's interesting about, you know, activism as it relates to the uh, to the Jehovah's Witness or ex Jehovah's Witness community is that um, the public doesn't always seem to the general public who doesn't have family members that are witnesses or haven't been witnesses themselves uh, sometimes are hesitant to even take an interest or they don't even know why this should be this the plight of jehovah's witnesses and former jehovah's witnesses should be something that they should you know devote their time in, in trying to understand what do you think is important for the public to to understand and know about the plight of jehovah's witnesses and former jehovah's witnesses well i would just say that uh it is it's a, this is a community that it's a pretty small community and there's a lot that you just unaware is going on mm -hmm. Uh, inside these communities, the way that people are trained to think, which you may feel is like really bizarre, but you have to understand that, that there is a, a sizable organization that that is the actual way that they think. So I would just encourage them that uh, to learn more about it, to learn more about uh, the problems within the organization, because uh, just the dissemination of the information is half the battle, really. Right. So. More publicity, listen, watching channels like yours, uh, just learn more about their their harmful beliefs. As mm -hmm. people, most people know, there's blood transfusion, and the shunning and child uh, abuse are the three biggest harmful policies. Uh, just inform yourself more about them mm -hmm. and look for ways that you can help and and basically spread the word. Right. Uh, to to where we need to. People need to stop looking at these religions like, oh, it's okay. They can do their own thing. They're not hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. um, they need to realize, yeah, they are hurting. They are hurting people, even though it may be members within their own community. But those are still people that need help. Um, I think other people have said it on on your channel and other channels that, uh, and I agree that Jehovah's Witnesses are really victims of of this doctrine and this uh, brainwashing, if that's what you want to call it. And they need help more than anybody. And um, we should do our part, but 
we want to do it respectfully, and I love to help them. Uh, there's no room for anger. There's no room for uh, looking down on them or calling them stupid or ignorant um, because they, they just basically they don't know what they're missing. They're, they're locked in a dark room, and they need mm-hmm. somebody to help, help bring them out. So uh, the more help that we can get, the better. So one thing I've been thinking about uh, lately, because I, I follow politics, not super closely, but I like keeping up with what's going on. Mm-hmm. And um, following this Trump presidency has been very interesting. But the more I watch him and his behavior, uh, the more uh, parallels and similarities I find between President Trump and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Would you like to hear the similarities that I have found between the Trump presidency and the Jehovah's Witness organization? Sure. Okay. Well, number one, it's pretty obvious, fake news, right? So anything that's critical of Trump, he labels automatic, oh, it's fake news. No, I'm not going to listen to it. It's, it's wrong. It's fake news. And that's exactly what the governing body, does. they label anything critical is apostate. Or in other words, fake news. It's, right. it's one-sided, it's biased, it can't be true, you know, fake news. So that's a glaring similarity that I find between the two. The that, second, that's true. I was going to mention something along those lines. Um, some some may have seen in my channel before. Sometimes I'll go up to witnesses at the, at the carts and things like that. And I've had several witnesses use the term "fake news" to absolutely. refer to the stories about you know these different stories that come out in the news and i did i i found that interesting too because i feel like that's a new term and you know apparently it's it seems to be have been adopted uh by many jehovah's witnesses so that's you know that's something to you know at least take a look at i think Uh, absolutely um uh i just can't help but think that these these two Groups of people are playing out of the same playbook. Mm. Um, so the second thing would be fear mongering. So President Trump is excellent at that. As as we all know, he can label a group of people as rapists, murderers. You know, we need to build the wall, keep out the bad hombres. It's it's us versus them. He's all about stirring up that that fear, and this is why we need to take this course of action. Uh, He'll demonize, he'll pick a certain group and demonize that group. But what is what do Jehovah's Witnesses do? That same exact thing. Mm. Demonize anyone critical of their views again, uh, labeling them apostate, uh, or just and again, like their worldview. It's us versus them. Anybody that's not one of us is against us. That that kind of thinking, that uh black and white, us versus them thinking. They go hand in hand. Like I said, it's like they're they're using the same playbook. Mm-hmm. Um, the third similarity I found, and this is pretty interesting that uh, you jogged my memory on this actually, uh, would be the lies, manipulation, you know, distortion of truth. Um, and we all know how Trump does that. Uh, recently, though, here's what I thought was interesting is he had a rally. And his crowd started saying something very bad. Uh, send her back. You may have heard this. Send her back. And what was his response to that? He shrugged. And it's like, no, I didn't tell them to say that, you know. Um, he also has, uh, a, you know, frequently says, well, people are saying, you know, it's his way of, of shrugging off responsibility. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't do it. People are saying that's their choice. And the parallel. I thought is with you were talking about the year 1975 and how, yes, if you look through Watchtower publications, you won't find anywhere in writing specifically where they say the end is coming in 1975, but they use the rhetoric. They use everything. They came close to saying everything but that. Mm -hmm. And again, people came to that conclusion themselves from the things they were saying. Oh, yeah, Leon's coming in, in 1975. I guess I need to sell my house or quit my job, whatever. And then when it doesn't happen, the reaction is, well, we didn't, we didn't tell you to say that. You know, it's that same 
same way of trying to distance yourself mm. from culpability that I see uh, between them. Uh, or another thing, a uh, serious thing, is uh, the policy regarding child abuse. And Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, we never tell people not to call the police, right? We never tell anyone you can't call the police. Yes, but you never tell them to call the police. So, again, it's the, this tricky way of being manipulative and mm-hmm. sidestepping, dodging responsibility uh, for your actions that I see similarity. And then the fourth thing that I've already talked about was Trump has a flair for exaggerating and drama. You know, he's mm-hmm. a reality TV show host. Uh, and so everything is the most extreme. It's it's tremendous, or it's the biggest you've ever seen, the best you've ever seen, or it's the worst you've ever seen. It, everything's an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. And also you've seen that within the witness, Jehovah's Witnesses, especially in their dramatization. Uh, every, the, this world is in such bad condition. You know, everything is exaggerated mm-hmm. uh, to the extremes. So those are four similarities that I found between Trump and Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Very interesting. I've, I've, I feel like I've heard people um, link link those two together, but never as thoroughly and as well explained as you've laid out here. So very, very interesting points to think about, for sure. Um, so with that, Jacob, I just want to thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for you know coming on and speaking with me. I know it's, it's a big deal to, to tell your story, and I know this is the first time you've ever done it publicly. So, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, definitely takes a, a deal of courage and and um, a degree of also, you know, just wanting to help others, uh, realizing that there's going to be many aspects of your story that benefit other people. So uh, I really want to applaud you and, and thank you uh, for taking time out to do that today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.